Hello and welcome to TU Dublin Talks, our sports podcast. Uh, today we have Jamie Moore, our men's soccer coach, on as our first guest speaker. So thanks for joining us, Jamie. No problem, Dan. How are you? Good, yourself? Yeah, very good, thanks. Not too bad, not too bad. So myself and Jamie are obviously maintaining our social distance. He's in Hout while I'm, I'm in Drimna, um, opposite sides of the city. So we're just going to go through a couple of things today with Jamie and his experience of being our Tudor in Blanchestown slash IT Blanchestown in the old days, soccer manager, um, his experience of being a coach and lots of other stuff. So I think we'll start at the start and just coaching. So obviously my background being uh, completing the sports management and coaching degree, a lot of people listening to this will be our sports management and coaching students, a lot of who will, who will aspire to be coaches one day or are coaches now. Just take us through your background, how you got involved in coaching and how you've progressed to where you are today. Yeah, so I tried to be a player. I was a goalkeeper when I was a kid uh, for Belvedere. And I was decent in the younger ages. And then as we got to kind of 13, 14, 15, I'm small now and I was certainly small then. Um, and I wanted to be involved in elite football. So I got a couple of injuries and... I left Belvo and joined Port Marnock for a year, maybe a year and a half. And Port Marnock were still in the Premier, but we would have been 16, 17. And we had a decent team, but you had the likes of your Belvos and your Cherry Orchard and your home farms back then that were really good in that league. And I didn't massively enjoy it. Um, so it was around that time, sitting in school, fourth and fifth year, where the FAI came in and did an introduction to coaching. It must have been in fourth year. So I did that. Um, my dad, John, has been heavily involved in football management and coaching for years and years and years. And he's had so many top teams in Belvo. So I was still involved in Belvo, helping out and working as kind of, you know, someone just filling up the water bottles and chasing footballs and putting down cones and stuff for his teams. Um, and then I started to coach some of the goalkeepers and warm up the goalkeepers and stuff. And it kind of started from there, and, and that's when I started to realise straight away that I wanted to try and go as far as I could as, as a football coach and eventually a football manager. So how did you go about, so we're talking like coach education, climbing the ladder, getting your badges and stuff, like how did you go through that route? Yeah, as I said, I did the first one in school, and then I did the youth cert when I was still quite young. I'm not sure on the exact timeline, Um I know Noel O'Reilly, who would have been the, the person in charge of FAI coach education, one of the best coaches I've ever seen. Uh, he died in 2007, very sadly, and he, I was on his last youth cert. His youth cert would have been around 2006 and 2007. And I remember on that course, on the first day of the course, he came in and he gave everybody a big slip of newspaper. And he said, I want you to make a hat. So we all made this hat and we're all looking around, kind of laughing and going, what's going on? So we made the hat out of, out of newspapers if you were a kid in school. And he asked us to put the hat on our heads. So we all put the hat on our heads and he said, that's your coaching hat. So he said, you're no longer a parent. You're no longer a player. You're no longer a referee. You're no longer a volunteer. You're now a coach. And even to this day, I'll always think back to that and remember that and say, right, if you're a coach or a manager, when you're actually working, it's the coach's hat on and everything else needs to be out the window. So that was the year we started around 2006. Um, I would have still been involved then just with Belvo and as I said my dad had some brilliant teams across the year, years like really 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 good teams top players and um, Jimmy Jackson would have been his coach and again Jimmy a massive influence on me and, and coaching and that's when I kind of started being involved just helping out with warm-ups and pre-match warm-ups and little bits and bobs around the train and around the games and kind of things things rolled from there I would have eventually through Jimmy Jackson got a phone call from Martin Russell in UCD he was the first year manager there at the time when the under-19 league was just starting. And that was around 2011 time. And basically, Martin was managing the UCD first team and the UCD 19s. And he was mm -hmm. looking for someone to come in and help him with the 19s. So that, that was my first kind of path into the League of Ireland. And from there, I did the B licence through the A licence, the U3A licence and stuff like that. Yeah, that's what I was going to mention that you obviously are uh, a very accomplished coach and that you've gone to the A licence. And then is it the elite youth a license. Full, yeah, a license then as well. Yeah. Um, so how then do you think like seeing your progression coming from, say, like you started off with being ball boy slash kit man slash water boy, whatever, do you think doing that first has helped you along the way to becoming, like say, a more elite coach in that sort of environment? Do you think that, because obviously some will just will jump straight into 
we'll jump straight into the badges, start off with their kickstarts or 4v4s or whatever it is, and work the way up. But do you think being in, like, starting kind of doing the groundwork first has helped you along the way? Yeah, 100%. Like, that's when I learned, and I learned by watching people and by watching the people around me in Belvo, and not just my dad and Jimmy Jackson, people like Derek O'Brien and Anto Corcoran and Graham Kearns, who were running other teams in the club, Ray McCann, Tommy Kenny. I, I can name them all, you know, teams from maybe mm. born 92, 93, 94 type age groups would have been the teams that I would have been around. So I would only have been a couple of years older than them, and I would still have had a good relationship with the players, but also be entrusted to be a coach or be a helper. And just watching those people working and how they did their training sessions and how they spoke to the players and how they did their pre-match warm-ups and how they behaved on the sideline. Some bits I liked, other bits maybe I didn't like. And I used all of those things to form what I wanted to be as a coach. Mm, and that was a, exactly. And, you know, still to this day, I still, if I can, try and get to watch the Pats first team train at least once a week and watch mm. what they're doing and watch other people involved in the scene in college and watch videos on YouTube and read books. And I'm still in the process of, of hopefully getting on my pro license in the next couple of years as well, that you never really stop learning. And that's something that I've I found. You can continue to pick up stuff all the time. Even if I'm at a premier game on a Friday night, I might watch a bit of a warm up that I like, or I might watch a corner that I like and just note it down on my iPhone. And then I need to refer back to what I have it there, you know, mm, that's a good way to do it. All right. We'll go on from UCD 19 from there. You've obviously then become the, at the time, IT Blanchetown men's soccer manager. So just talk us through that kind of transition going from a League of Ireland set up uh, into tour level and then from being a coach into being the gaffer. Yeah, so I was with UCD for a couple of seasons with the 19s and, and in and around the first team as well. Just helping out with doing the video and that sort of stuff and uh, working at the UCD summer camps and working at the UCD schools program. So the great couple of years at UCD, massive, massive enjoyable part of my my life and my career and from there I actually went to Shamrock Rovers and it was from Shamrock Rovers that I ended up getting the IT mm. Blanchestown job I went into Shamrock Rovers with Declan Heavey as one of the coaches with his 19s and a couple of months later Declan left the club and Colin Hawkins who was the first team coach under Trevor Crawley was appointed the 19s manager and he kept me on on the staff and we had a great end to the season I think we won 10 or 11 games in a row just missed out on winning the league and around that time, at the end of 2013, the news came out that Shamrock Rovers B were being put into the first division. And looking back now in hindsight, the plan, obviously, from the club was to put Colin Hawkins into the 19s mm. with a view to him becoming the B team or the, the, yeah, the B team manager because a lot of the players would have progressed up. And thankfully, again, along with Noel Weiss and Richie Fitzgibbon, the goalkeeping coach, I was kept on on the staff with the, with the B team and... Again, that was a brilliant time. And, you know, myself and Colin, you know, between us, we're taking all the training sessions. We were training three times a week plus the game in the AUL directly after the first team are training. They trained at mm. half four in the afternoon. So I was able to watch them train every day for the year. And, you know, getting to go to stadiums like Tonka Park and Galway and all these other clubs. And at that time, there was only eight teams in the first division. And um, mm. that was brilliant and really, really, really good. And I think I would have been, well, that 2014, it's now 2020. That, I, I would have been 24 then. Mm. And in the middle of that season, unfortunately, um, Hawk's father passed away on the day before we had an away game against Finn Harps. So I actually managed the team in the first division to a 1-0 win away to Finn Harps when I was 24. Trying to and, fame. Uh, that was brilliant. Like, I remember there was a big crowd that day and, you know, teams from up that part of the country, as you know, from the games in the college, there yeah. would be massively massive fans of people from Dublin and teams from Dublin. So it was a hostile place and Chris Lyons scored the winner from a penno and that was just amazing for me. It looked really, really, really good. And a couple of weeks later, the news broke that the club, um, Pat Fennell was the manager at the time, the B team was discontinued after a year, which was massively disappointing. We had a brilliant team yeah. and we did really well. I think we finished sixth that year, which with the budget we had and the players we had, like we didn't get whipped every week. Yeah. So Hawks at the time, his full-time job was with Shamrock Rovers. He played in England, being a top League of Ireland player for his career. He needed to get a job. So he got a job in Diageo for a Christmas contract. And that's when the call came. He asked me, would I take over from him and Blanche for a couple of months to see what happened with his job? And then thankfully for him in the January, he was offered a full-time job. He's there now six years and he's progressed really well. Mm. I think he's a regional manager now. And I'm still at Blanche and, and hopefully I've done an okay job so far. No, not too bad. I'm sure most would say anyways. Um, so you've come in then, like I was saying, to tour level football bit of a different environment. Um, obviously, you've taken, now taken three teams um, in our men's section. Um, 
you're talking kind of levels like you'd obviously be used to so even from Belvedere uh, a lot of skill boy they're still top club very good players a lot of players that would have went abroad um, professional players turned into and then obviously the likes of UCDs Shamrock Rovers B um, you're talking still top level in the country and then you come into college football where you might not always have that and some of the you might have teams where you'll have players who have never played at that sort of level so how was that sort of transition because obviously we're talking about kind of you're used to players just being able to kind of to do what you're asking to do most or if not all the time and you've obviously worked with such good players that you come into in an environment where not saying players aren't good but they just obviously haven't been played at that level where you're used to was that difficult to try and kind of manage the different levels within three teams? Well, it's something that I really enjoy and I enjoy the task and the challenge of even working with the first team in Blanche in comparison to the fresher team or the C team in Blanche because the levels are different. But what I have found, and I think you'll agree across the, the six years I've been in, in the college so far, 99.9% of the players are great lads and will try their best for you. And in every team talk I give, whether that be with the Pats 19s, the Blanche first team, the Blanche C team, is I just want the players to try their best and that when they mm -hmm. come in after the match, they look at each other, they look at me, they look at the other coach and staff, they look in the mirror and they say that they tried their best. And if they do that, that's all I can ask for. And there's been even games this season where, you know, all the teams have lost different games. I know the first team finished in the, the top four in the Premier and got to the Cup quarterfinal and stayed up in our first year in the Premier. Mm -hmm. The second team, as you know, won the, won the Cup and, and the C team got to, I think, two semi-finals, won them in the Shield as well. So, from that mm. sense, once the lads try their best, yes, there's a difference in standard, but like our Blanche first team is full of top players, whether they be mm. playing League of Ireland, whether they be playing Leinster Senior League or AUL, and they're all young lads, so it's not a massive difference in terms of dealing with, say, the Pats 19s to the Blanche teams, because like the majority of students, the max age they'll be is 21, 22, and that's not a massive difference. Yes, we've had some mature students who've all been yeah. great, but I do enjoy the challenge, and I do love knowing that every time a Blanche team of mine plays a game, that they're going to try their best, they're going to work hard. That sounds like a cliche, but if you know your team is going to do that, it's a massive, massive plus, and it makes it all worthwhile, really, you know? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, sticking in the kind of the link in between tour level football and League of Ireland football, I um, just want to speak a bit about the pathway that not many people might know there is, that from in playing at college level, um, that there is a way then, and a lot of people have experienced then ways into underage or even first team League of Ireland level setups um, just kind of your thoughts on that and the benefits of playing tour level football yeah well a good example of that is Rob Manley who many people will know Rob is our striker with the first team um, he's going into third year next year he'll be in second year at the moment I think I'm right in saying he's in second year uh, yeah I think so so when Rob came into college into first year he'd been with UCD 19s he'd been with Bowles 19s I think he'd been with the draw the first team as well at the time mm. and he came into Blanche and our season kind of starts around October time. Yeah. And he just finished the League of Ireland season or was finishing one and, and with Drada, I think, and hadn't really got a massive amount of game time. And mm. sat down with him and spoke to him and he had a brilliant few weeks for us. So our season, we'll play six league games, October, November time, kind of six weeks in a row with the Cups thrown in. It might be eight weeks with eight games. And I've always tried to help out lads in the college with helping them with their League of Ireland stuff. So if they don't have a club or they want to change club or they want some help, I'll always try and help them. And the way I'll help them is I'll try and put on a very good environment for them to perform. And then I'll send out a WhatsApp on a Monday to all the League of Ireland managers around. I'm not going to send a WhatsApp to Stephen Bradley at Shamrock Rovers because he's realistically not going to sign a player from TU Dublin Blanchardstown. But to like to your Longfords and your Drotters and your Cabin Teelys and... Shelburne at the time we're in the first division that, mm. that sort of stuff I'll send out messages at Lone Town and stuff and a couple of managers came to watch Rob playing for the college and he did great and he ended up signing for Cabin Teeley. and last year in the first division he was Cabin Teeley's top scorer he won the player of the year the PFI player of the year and he's now been transferred to Longford or signed for Longford who are going to compete to try and get promoted and I would like to think I helped Rob in a small way but I'm very happy that the environment and the platform that we, we gave him and me sending a WhatsApp to a few managers, including Pat Devon from Cabin Teeley, mm. helped them get signed. And there's loads of players that we, we can use examples of that, 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 that have done that and used the college as their stage to help their careers, whether it be club-wise, League of Ireland-wise, but also people like Jamie Hollywood and Mikey Scott and others have played for the Irish Universities team mm. and played for their country in the World University Games off the, back of, yeah, off the back of their performances for the college. So 
if people do treat it properly, not only will they enjoy it and, you know, will it be a big part of their life in college? Because I do think the football in Blanche is a massive part of, of, of people's lives there, yeah. including mine and yours. And if the lads can use that for whatever reason they have to help them, that's the gig of me as a manager is to, is to help them do that, you know? Mm. So I think like a, a lot of people wouldn't realise that there is that sort of connection there between the two and you, you wouldn't really expect a League of Ireland manager to go out and watch a college match. Like, I'll even talk about from personal experience with the with the pathway, I remember coming in in first year and playing for Crumlin under 19s LSL at the time. And I can't remember which game it was now, but I played obviously decent in a couple of games. And then you pulled me after one of them and asked, which looking back on it now is kind of a funny question like, would you be interested in playing League of Ireland in the 19s? And then I'm just thinking in my head, like, is this a joke or what? Because, like, although I had been playing at a decent level with Crumlin, whatever, and had never really thought of going under going that route into the underage kind of League of Ireland setup. Uh, didn't think it would ever have been for us. And then just even through that, was able to obviously you put plans in place, was able to do a couple of weeks training, uh, signed for Pats 19s in the mid season break and went from there and stayed in the setup. And I think that even there's a like my whole sort of kind of I wouldn't call it much of a career, but say League of Ireland kind of connection has come through college football. Like I'm saying, that was my introduction. And then after that, I'd signed for a Longford Town 19s and was lucky enough to captain them as well for the season I was there. But their manager got on to me saying that he'd watched me in college games. And then from then on, making a step up to senior football at Long Town, it was Aaron Callahan who gave me, a rank, gave me a ring at the time and said that, yeah, seen a couple of college matches. So, and then finally... The club was with was Cabin Teely, and that was yourself who had gone on to Pat Devlin um, when I was looking for a club similar to Rob, that situation. So, but if it hadn't been, say, if I hadn't, say, if I had went to a different college or if I didn't go to, if I didn't go to do a degree or anything like that, I don't think I would have made that step up. I don't think it would have happened. So I think people will underestimate the power that it has playing in, playing in college. Yeah, well, I think what the majority of the people around the League of Ireland would know is that we do things properly and we behave properly and we try and do it as professionally as we can. And I keep using this word environment because I think it's very important that, you know, when the players arrive for a college game or a college session, the same way as they arrive for a Pats 19, that it's, everything is ready for them and that they mm. know that I've done my work and the coaching staff have done their work to prepare for them. And I do think that, you know, the League of Ireland managers know that and they do know that if they come to watch us play, that we play a decent brand of football, you know, we'll be organised properly and the lads will be taking the game seriously. I can't speak for other managers in other, you know, yeah. universities and colleges around about what they do or who they speak to. But I know if I ring up or I send a WhatsApp to any League of Ireland manager about a certain player, like, for example, if it was you or if it was Rob or if it was Mikey Scott or Jamie Hollywood mm. or Stephen Ball or Alan Kyo or whoever it was, you know, in, in most recent times, even the likes of Dan McKenna, Collie McCabe and others, like, if I ring, you know, I think this year even Eric Abulu signed for Longford off the back of, of, of you know, me making a call to someone and helping them, helping them like that I know you'll be able to do the work properly and that if you do go into the League of Ireland club that you'll impress them and you'll do well and I would never ring a League of Ireland manager or anybody else for anybody if I didn't trust them and I didn't feel that they were going to mm. go and do their stuff so I, I think it works both ways the managers know that the lads are good lads and that they're okay players and that they're being treated properly and coached properly and I know that when they do go into those places that they will do themselves proud and ultimately do the college proud as well you know yeah, um, sticking with Blanche and coaching the Blanche. So for people that don't know, obviously we have our pitch on campus and big Astro, great pitch, um, top of the range. But we obviously have a little nickname for it and we call it the cage. But for people that don't know what the cage is or what it kind of means, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so you came in in 2015 and Jamie Hollywood was the same year, correct? Yeah, that's right. So Jamie uh, just graduated last year, would have been our captain through the time and you would have been captain for a lot mm -hmm. of it too uh, during the time when we were in the first division and we eventually, thank God, got promoted to the Premier in, in the final last year in, in, in the last game for five or six years who were, yeah. were finished college. And very early in that 2015 year, um, sorry, my dog is climbing on me here. Um, very early in that 2015 year, we were doing, I always do uh, like a little team huddle. Most, most times before the team go out, um, I get the lads to walk around the change room, shake hands with each other. This is before the virus where you could actually shake hands with people. Yeah. And uh, just as a little, you know, 
let's be together lads and so on and so forth that have their music on and I love that five six minutes when we come in from the warm up and the music is really loud and everyone has their own routine doing their tape doing their jersey doing the water in their hair doing whatever they need to do to get I think that was just ready. you with the water in the hair probably was it was hairspray for me um, but like that few minutes when the, it, people are just in, in that zone and anyway I, I did the first huddle I think it was for the first league game I can't really remember now because when you're doing the three teams for six years mm. you're in so many dressing rooms and there's so many games a lot of them kind of blend into one if that makes sense Yeah. and I did the huddle and I said my piece and then I named Jamie captain and Jamie jumped in and basically said that this is our cage this is our pitch and when people come into our cage, they're basically in for a fight and in for a battle and in for a beating. And that was the kind of line that he used. I'm, I'm not sure of the exact quote, but that when we went in the door of the cage and we closed the gate behind us for a whole match, that nobody was coming into our cage for any sort of an easy match or any sort of a, a walk in the park. And I tried to use the analogy of the first five minutes of each game in the cage is the other team knows that they're in for a real, real, real match here. And... Even since Jamie left, we've continued that on. And it's just something that's kind of subconscious now. And other people from other colleges and other clubs give it a laugh and slag it. But they can slag it all they want because it works. And mm. I can guarantee any away team that's come into our cage for a match in Blanche over the last five, six years knows what the cage is about like. Yeah, definitely. And funny enough that they come from Jamie because his secondary skill and my secondary skill would have been relatively close and have played a couple of games against each other. But they called themselves the Brotherhood. And... Like saying that we used to slag them off and this, that, and the other. But then when it comes into one and it's your own, I think it became more of a mentality than anything else. Like you're saying that we know that anyone that comes in to the cage, that it's not going to be easy. And I think even though, like, obviously that come from one team, it's spread through our three teams. And now, even that we're all gone and graduated, that it's something that will continue. Well, hopefully, anyways. Um, that yourself and then the lads that know what it is will continue with the new crop of players that come in year on year because I think it's it, what's, it, it's a bit of an identity thing and sets us apart from other colleges that we know that we're going to do this our way Oh 100% 100% and you know it has made a difference now saying that playing the whole match in the cage doesn't necessarily mean you're going to win it's very important that mm. you know we play well and the players play well and I've got the plan right or you've got the plan right and you know, all that sort of stuff. So it's not just, oh, we're in the cage, so we're going to win. But it's we're in the cage, so in, in our own heads, it's that home advantage. The same way as, you know, Liverpool playing in Amphi, or you know, whatever it might be, it's that home advantage. And we've had some great results in Blanche, yeah. in the cage in, in recent times. And like, apart from the actual pitch, you know, the facility itself, and there was a photo recently on Instagram, someone put up of a team a couple of years ago when the new sports complex was being built. Mm. And it's built now, and the change rooms are fantastic the physio room, we've access to the meeting rooms on match day or training day if we need them to do presentation or PowerPoints. The gym upstairs, if people want to do prehab or whatever, um, you know, it's a really, really, really good facility for people to come and play football. I know that myself, my Pats 19 is trained there almost full time as well. And it's a top facility. And with the cage there and the Astro being great and the little stand and the gantry for the camera and yeah. all that, it's it's a perfect venue to be fair. It really, really is. And, and everybody has been involved in making it the way it is. You know, people who've been through interns like yourself, Rona Case, get the head of sport, other people in the college, like all those things cost money. And it, it has become a really, really, really good facility for everybody that uses it, but particularly for, from our sense for the college teams, you know? Mm. Um, just even in that, mentioning when you first came in, it was 2014, so I would have come in the year later. I'm right in saying that it was just... The building itself was just the gym at that time, wasn't it? There was no extension onto classrooms or there was, and that was it. Yeah, so when people came in, the, 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 for people that haven't been there, when, when you come in the main door now, you turn right and there's two sports offices, there's toilets, kit rooms, and there's changing rooms, physio room, meet rooms, and then a massive big lecture hall and the same upstairs with a spinning studio and stuff. But yeah, it was just the gym and there was just a desk outside the gym. The desk that's there now is where the sports interns work from. And the kit room was across the way. And that, I remember walking in the first day to, to meet Ronan to take my first training session or whatever when Colin had, had had to take a break or whatever. And that was it then. And it's just grown and grown and grown. And I'm sure there'll be other ways that we can make it even better as the years go on. Yeah, because I say I would have come in then in 2015. I remember it was still like, it was more like the building was like a stack. And now it's this whole sort of sports pavilion. So that's great to see um, that there is the kind of progression that sport is it's prioritised in the place in that we get these facilities and it shows, I think, with 
I think there's like, obviously against like, stuff that we would have learned in our degree like that. Um, putting money and kind of time at the facilities will reap the rewards in terms of performance on the pitch in the long run. I think that's fair to say over the last couple of years that we've been fairly successful as a college between our men's teams and our women's. Um, while we brought him up, I, I was going to mention him later on. I'm going to talk a little bit about Ronan. So we'll always give Ronan obviously a bit of stick and, and whatnot, and obviously he plays into it. Um, but he does a lot for us um, in terms of sport, and more so for us, it would be soccer. Um, being a, a Kevin Gah man like himself, um, it would be very easy for him to shun us off. But talk to us about your relationship with Ronan and just kind of from the beginning to kind of where it is now. Because obviously it's a, I, wouldn't, I don't know if we can call it a love-hate, but it's more of a, a love and annoyance relationship between the two of you. Yeah, so anybody that knows me and anybody that's, that's worked with me in any of the clubs that I've been in or in the case of Blanche, in the case of Ronan, I want the best for the players and I want the best for the group and I'll ask for that and if I don't get it at different times, I won't be too happy about it because I do believe, and you just mentioned there about money and investment in facilities, I do believe even apart from that, you know, simple things like having, you know, nice bibs and proper footballs and, you know, some small equipment for prehab, like little mats and foam rollers and mini bands and, you know, simple things that help the players to prepare for training or games, I believe is very, very important. And I'll always try and get that for the players because I believe if that's done and I do my job properly, that I can tell them, well, they have no excuse not to perform because everything is there for them. So I came in in 2014, I walked upstairs and I met Ronan and he's been great. And to be honest with you, in the six years, anything that I've asked for that's been reasonable has been there. Whether that be, you know, the buses, the food for away games before the match. Even for a year or two, we did food after home games for our own home team mm. and stuff. To having a physio at the games. To having basically everything. The new kits. We had a home kit. We wanted an away kit. We wanted extra socks. We wanted extra shorts. We wanted training gear. Now, albeit some of that was part paid for by the players. Mm. In terms of increasing the number of scholarships that we have. And everything else. He's been absolutely brilliant. And yet, you know, the odd time we might have a little, I wouldn't even call it a row, we'd have a little difference of opinion. But deep down, he knows that I'm looking for the best for the football or the soccer, as he calls it. And yeah. I know that he's looking for the best for the college and he's trying to run the guard teams, and the rugby teams and the basketball teams. And there's so much going on that it's not just football. Now, I do think in the last couple of years, you know, the football, we've had our three teams and our ladies team, which is probably up to, you know, 80 players. And we've won mm. club of the year the last couple of years at the clubs and society's ball. And, you know, it's a very, very, I, I would say it is the most participated sport in the college. So from that sense, I, I do think, you know, everything that we've been given has been deserved because it, it is a sport that's providing for maybe 80 people to play on a weekly basis for kind of six months of the year. Um, but you see Ron, he's on the phone and he's down in the other office down in, in, in C Block and he's organising different things for different people. And he's trying to deal with people in the college and people in other colleges and people in the different areas and what he has done really well is is the interns and I'm not just saying this because you're on the on the on the Skype with me but over the years the the, the interns have played a massive part in, in helping me as a football manager mm. but I'm assuming and I'm sure helping him as the head of sport as well you know yeah and that's actually one thing that was I have down here as well about work relationships um we had spoken about it remember on the bus down to we are going to our final on the way to Atlanta we are speaking about interns and for myself, it's like, what's the future plans and whatever. And then we we're just talking about um, your dealings with past interns. And I know we're saying that as it's only a one year sort of rolling contract that you don't get to keep the same amount of people and you'll get sort of a revolving door of two new people every year. Um, just obviously you've said that the interns over the years, you've dealt with a lot of them. But how important really are they like to the success that you've had as the manager of the football teams? Well, they're massively important. And I heard Vinnie Perk, the Dundalk manager, on a podcast during the week. And he was talking about, you know, managing a small business, that he's managing 30 people. He's managing, say, you know, 22 players. He's managing six staff. Then he's managing the managing director of the club or the social media person of the club. And he's actually managing a small business. And I would equate that to what we're doing or what I'm doing in the college is that I'm probably trying to manage 50 people across the three teams. And then you have, you know, external factors like, the FAI and the people doing the fixtures and the people doing the referees and the people booking the buses and the people doing the food and the people doing the gear. There's a lot to it. Mm. And the interns for me take a lot of the stuff away from the football, away from me. So I'll send you an email at the start of the week with 
when I want the food, what time I'd like the bus, what time I'd like the physio. And in general, the intern, whether it be you or whether it be Tiff or Kelly or the people the previous years, mm. will sort that. Same with player registration, same with all of the other bits that are away from the football. Because believe me, when you're trying to manage 50 footballers and manage three different WhatsApp groups and just three games a week and there's training sessions and there's international call-ups to be sent out and there's scholarships mm. to be organised, there's quite a lot to it. And from the period of probably the middle of September when the trial starts, to February, March when the finals are on it is almost full time and I love yeah. it that it's full time but there's been times this year where we've been on WhatsApp to each other at midnight trying to yeah. sort players and <laughs> trying to sort stuff like yeah. and that's the gig and I'll do that because I need to make sure that it works for everybody but the interns all of them have had a massive role and there is a lot of level of trust there because I used to be very very I try and micromanage everything because I wasn't I wanted it to be done properly mm. but once now you have a trust in the people and the staff that you're working with you can ask them and, and, you know, say, I would like this or I would like that. And you know they'll do it. And you know if mm. they can't do it, they'll let you know and they'll let you know why, which is, which is a really, really important thing. Yeah. And yes, every year the interns do roll on. And for me, like this year, for example, it's the, it's the I think, the second time ever that I've had, you know, a, an ex-player as, mm. as an intern in you. And you've managed the second team. And it's been great. And I would love for that to roll on. But at the same time, I understand the reasons for giving new people an opportunity. And also for you guys to jump now, I know you gave a presentation recently along with some of the other ex-interns about where they've progressed and their jobs in football. So from that sense, I, I understand it. But from a selfish sense, I would love for you guys to stay. But I don't think that's going to happen somehow. No, I don't think uh, we'll be allowed. But you can certainly put in a case to Ronan and see what he says. One of your other many list of demands. Well, he'll be watching this, so he'll know by then. He won't be able to use this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to speak then about... So we've talked a lot about your time as uh, branch manager and stuff. Um, highs and lows so give me a couple of examples through your six years is now uh, well the highs are are two finals in the last couple of years uh, the first team that you were a part of won the first division uh, beating Tallinn the final 1-0 yeah. in a lone town stadium last year so we were in the first division for the previous time that I was in, in the college and we've been trying very hard to get promoted we got close a couple of times and, and didn't manage to do it with some very very good teams mm. and last year we got promoted beat Talent in the final 1-0 Owen Morgan had been sent off and Mikey Scott scored the winner and we had to defend for our lives in the last few minutes of that game Yeah. and the final whistle and that and I've, I've been lucky enough with Pats and with Blanche in the last few seasons to win four trophies the 17s league with Pats in 2016, the Lenten Senior Cup of Pats last year, our trophy I mentioned, and then the second team winning the cup place in at Lone, also against Tal a couple of weeks ago. And that 45 minutes between the final whistle blowing, the celebrations on the pitch immediately, the lifting of the trophy, and more importantly, that few minutes back in the dressing room when mm. the music is on full blast and people are literally dancing around, squirting the water and making Snapchat and Instagram videos and that just those moments of euphoria of winning are why you do it for me they're why you do it because if you compare the other way around when you lose a final and we've lost finals and we've lost semi-finals and you can hear the other dressing room and it's not nice but when you're in the winning one that mm. winning feeling is if, if, I could put, if I could put it in a bottle and, and have it you know after every final but the ones you lose make the ones you win sweeter mm. so for me that's one of the examples of the, the highs. The other high, and this is going to sound a bit corny or, or a bit cringy, is seeing players who I've worked with and managed doing well in their lives and doing well in their careers when they've left us and when they're with us. And I'm not going to list off, but there's loads of lads who are playing the League of Ireland, playing top LSL, working in really good jobs, mm. you know, living a good life that I think, you know, I remember when I, when I was involved in Belvedere, the slogan was, more than just a football club and it was about teaching people about life and about you know how to be good people as much as it was to be footballers and I think that's yeah. been similar in Blanche and to see lads going on and you know you see them on Instagram or you maybe meet them in town every now and again or you bump into them somewhere or you watch them playing a match or you see them live score they've scored a goal or they've got an assist and it, you think that's great they've come through Blanche and we've mm. helped them to Lowe's as I kind of said at the start once I know that the lads are doing their best I can't really have too many complaints we lost a couple of big semi-finals. Even this year, we lost to Carlo yeah. in, a, in a semi-final. I think it was a quarter-final we lost. And the C team lost on Penos in a semi-final. And the second team lost in a semi-final to try and make their second final in Galway. And they're, they're lows in a certain extent. But I always say to the lads, you know, 
nobody has died. And I know in, in this day and age, what's going on with the virus and stuff, it's, you know, it's, it's really, really concerning for the world. So that puts football in context. We yeah. lost a couple of water finals over the years. You know, we've had a couple of serious injuries, which haven't been nice, that we're trying to, you know, help the lads. Around. Thankfully, the college and the insurance and stuff is great with all that. So although you lose a football match and you, a couple of days you're feeling a bit crap, when you get up and you get on with it, you, you keep going. So I wouldn't say there's been too many lows in that sense mm. because the lads are trying their best. It's a good place to be. I think we all come in and we smile and we have a laugh and, you know, yeah. we, have a, we, we have a bit of crack. Yes, we work seriously, but it's a place I think, I like to hope that people come and enjoy themselves with a couple of hours they're in when they're playing football or training. And I think that's the main thing, really. Well, I can say from my own experience of being a player for four years that I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I think it, it probably is, if not, it's it's right up there with the most enjoyable football I've played. Like, talking club football, all the way from Skillboy into League of Ireland stuff and whatever, I think it's probably the most enjoyable football I've played. Um, and we speak about highs and lows. Obviously, I was lucky enough to be involved in three finals in four years. And that's why you consider a high, but also lost two of them. Um, look, then it ties into what you say that the ones you lose make the ones you win so much sweeter. And then losing one in first year, um, and losing we obviously got the two finals last year, um, cup and league, and losing the cup final like the week before you got to play the league final could have been easy to like drop heads and be like in a bad headspace about it. But we got the job done, and like we're saying, just made that that win so much sweeter. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think, you know, from that sense, we, we've all enjoyed it. And uh, like you hear coaches all the time say it's, it's not about winning, it's about performance and it's about development and stuff. Mm. I, I would say at college level, particularly with the first team and the second team, it's about both. I think it is important for us to try to win. And yeah. I know, and we'll go back to Ronan. Ronan doesn't really care if we win or lose. He, he cares that, that it's run properly and that the mm-hmm. people who are participating in it are being treated properly and that they're, they're behaving properly and that sort of stuff. So from that sense... You know, you know, it, it's it's not to be all and end all, but when we're trying to be professionals and we're trying to train properly and look, I make a lot of demands on the players. I really do, and you know, at times some of them probably think, you know, whatever. But I think when you do make those demands on them, it helps the environment and it helps you to win. And let's not lie, everyone in, in, involved in elite sport, and, and I would qualify college football, particularly with the first team and the second team as elite sport that we want to win and if we can win it's great yeah. but if we if we don't win and we've done all the things to try and win it's not the end of the world right so we've said highs and lows if you had to pick one moment across six years your favourite moment as the ITB slash TU Dublin Banchtown football manager what is it can I pick two no because the two of them are the the two finals in the last two years the first team winning and the second team winning last week and I love them both um I'm obviously going to have to pick the first team one because the, the, the reason being that was the first division final to get to the Premier Division, something we've been trying to do for five years. And being in the Premier Division last year and managing to make the top four and managing to qualify and managing to stay up was brilliant. The second team, a couple of weeks ago, beating Tala's first team, beating Atlone's first team in the previous round or the round before that. And again, a lot of those lads in their final year was another massive, massive high. But that was... I think a play final in the cup. Mm. Yes, brilliant and really good. And I'd like to pick both, but if I have to pick one, it's definitely the team, the first team winning the first division and getting promoted to the Premier. Mikey Scott's goal, Eric Abulu's cross, the final whistle, the celebrations, the night out, all of it. Brilliant. Really yeah, it was good. great. Okay, there's no shame in, I suppose, coming second choice to that. Another, another one for you. So you can give me two answers if it's not the same person. So from your Pats coaching your own team, so 17s and 19s since you made a step up, and your Blanche teams across six years, best player you've coached? Oh, wow. Mm. Um, I would have needed, I w- I would have needed um, pre-warning of this to think about it. This was a surprise. Because it's like, it's hard to answer. I would love to try and pick, I'd love to, love to actually try and pick a team across all of them. Like, just to get background, like the Pat 17s I had from 2015 when the 17s started to shoot to 2018, uh, won the league, made a couple of finals, had like international after international and mm. really good players born 99, 2000, 2001. And now with the 19s, we 2002, 2003s. And the Blanche teams have been so good. Uh, I, I, it's very hard. It's very, very hard. Um Yeah, it's very hard. The best player, as in the best footballer. 
Yeah. You see, p- see, people in my current teams will be offended. Um, well, if the player is oh, okay, that good... Okay, 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 okay. I'm not going to pick someone that I'm currently managing, right? Is that fair? Okay. Okay, so therefore they can't be offended because they're not up for selection. Um... There's two, right? Ryan Burke, I who played it. for my Pat 17s. Yeah. Who's from near you. Yeah. Uh, Burke, plays for Birmingham City now. He's born in 2000. He was only a pass for a year. Went away to the UK. Left back. Technically unbelievable. Corner, set pieces, passes. Only a little fella, but like what absolutely nailed it in a tackle. Yeah, so, and a right peg player. to go with it. Even but though he's, he's a lefty. Yeah, he, yeah. He's fair, scored, yeah. I've seen a few videos of some goals, all right. Yeah, Funny enough, that's I, what I, I said to Tiff last night. I was like, I'm going to ask ask you this question. I goes, I have a feeling he's going to say Ryan Burke. Yeah, so Ryan Burke would be one. Mm. Uh, John, a fella called John Martin, who was an identical twin. Um, he was with Belvo when I was at Belvo. He played for the same 19th team as mm. Burke. He, he plays for Waterford now, attacking midfielder. Uh, there was one game, actually, they both scored six goals in the game, would you believe? Not at the same time. I remember there's a photo of Burke with six footballs in blank yeah, after that. scoring. But John Martin scored six or seven, I think, against... We beat Dundalk 13-1 or something. Um, in the was that in Richmond? Scored. That was in Richmond, yeah. Yeah, I remember. I've seen the picture. Um, so they were two... They are two top players. Berkey's in the UK. Um, excuse me. And he was a great pro. He'd arrive to training, foam roller, mini bands, food for afterwards. Always trained brilliantly. Mm. John is from Carlo, a Kilkenny border, along with his brother Paul, who was a goalkeeper. And they were travelling up three, four times a week, 90 minutes each way, and doing great as well. So they'd be two from Pats. Uh, like Ro- the Rovers team, the UCD team had great players as well. Like, yeah. Like, um, and you said Chris Lyons. Yeah, was Chris in that Lyons, UCD great, team, great really striker. Good playing now for Drogheda, should be mm. in the Premier for me. I know Tim Clancy won't won't help me, won't be happy with me saying that. Really good, really good striker. Um, college wise, um, college wise, we've like when I first joined, we had Sam Verdon. Like Sam mm. Verdon was was there. He's playing the League of Ireland now. With Luke Keeney from my past team, we've had yourself, Jamie Hollywood, Mikey Scott, Stephen Ball, who's got another brilliant left foot, and I'm going to have to say shot cross here. Yeah, I was going to bring it up. <laughs> um, do you want to tell people the private joke, or will I? I think I'll let you explain it. So just give people a bit of context. Um, there's a, we'll call it a coaching cue or a tactic that Jamie likes to uh, instill in us, like for our wingers and wide players, our number 10s, that's a, a shot cross. Um, so I'll let you run away with it now and explain what a shot cross is. So a shot cross is very obvious. It's a shot or a cross that's on target that if everybody misses it, or with a couple of goals last year by Rob Mandy and Mikey Scott, that Stephen Ball plays an in-swinger that's curling low and flat, that's on target, that if everybody misses it and the keeper can't move, it might go in. But if it's flicked in or flicked on by a striker or whoever, by you or Andy McKenna, whoever's at centre-back, that it goes in. And it's white free kicks, corners, open play. All across my years at uh, Pats and Rovers and UCD and Blanche has been a favourite of mine. So Stephen Ball shot crosses are something that was very, very useful for us. Um, but yeah, you see, the problem is I'm, I'm good mates with a couple of the Blanche boys because they're, you know, mid-twenties and out of mm. college now. And like you, Jamie Hollywood, Mikey and so on, like, I can't really pick an ex-Blanche player because the, the others will never talk to me again. <laughs> <laughs> um, go back to the shot cross. Where did it come from? I don't know where it came from. I think it just came from, and anytime I see one now, on a match or whatever, I'll take a video and I'll send it to the Pat's WhatsApp group and also to the Blanche WhatsApp group. And people kind of slag me and hashtag shot cross and whatever. But I believe it's a great way to score goals and a simple enough Definitely. way to score goals. And if you have, you know, a left foot like Stephen Ball or this year like Connor Fowler or Lefty, for some reason, Lefty seem to be really good at it. Yeah. Um, or a right footer. Um, like they're really good. I, I, don't, I don't know where it came from, but. I love them. They're, they're my favourite. T- a header's my favourite type of goal. So if it's a header off a shot cross, I'm celebrating, man. Yeah, and between Baller and Mikey Scott, that's your, your dream, isn't it? Crosses and yeah. headers. Well, Mikey Scott is the best header of a ball I've ever managed. I'll give you that much. I've, Defensive sets, I'd, attacking I'd, sets. I'd agree with that. Unbelievable. Yeah. Um, just to tidy up then, coming towards the end, going to talk a bit about you. Um, you'd mentioned earlier about pro license. So that's one thing I'd written down. Um, obviously you're still quite a, a young coach especially for how high up the coaching ladder coach education whatever you will uh, that you are next say five years five ten years what, what are we talking what's the plans coaching wise 
Uh, well, I'm 30 now, unfortunately. So I've actually been kind of involved in in the college and in the league of in the, in the league of Ireland now for for eight years or nine years, and the college for six. So I think the amount of hours and the amount of matches that I've managed, you know, I have quite good experience now, and I think that's you learn from every match and every scenario and every decision you make and everything you do, you learn from it. And through the coaching courses as well, I would like to do the pro license in the next couple of years um, because that's the last qualification you can have from a mm. coaching sense. Now, in terms of actual coaching, the A license and the U3A A license are, are the highest coaching ones. The pro is more management and finances and contracts and stuff. So it's not actually yeah. very much about coaching. Um, I'm loving Blanche. I'm loving Pat's. So at the moment, I'm very, very happy in both of those. And given the Blanchard, the Premier, and although the league with the, the 19s is suspended at the moment due to the virus, can't wait for that mm. to start back. We have a great squad yeah, this year with the Pats 19s. Um, so from that sense, I'm really happy. I can't map out where I'm going to be. Yes, I want to be a first-team manager. Yes, I want to be a first-team coach. A coach in America for six months in 2013 with Global Premier Soccer. Love mm. that. The American life in the sun, working in the college or the MLS is something that appeals to me. Um, the UK, not so much, not so much. America, Australia, possibly. Mm. Um, but at the moment, I'm very, very happy in, in Dublin, happy around my family and friends. Uh, my media work is going great. My football work is going great. Uh, I would say about 80% of my work now is football, which is great. Yeah. And um, that's the dream. And if, you know, if you'd ask me tomorrow, will I give up radio to be a football manager? It's a tough, tough, tough decision. Mm. Like, um, so, yeah, I don't know. Once I'm working at a good level, and being able to get up every morning and most mornings and go and work in football, that's it. And if I continue to do that, I'm happy. And because things could change tomorrow, you know, something could happen with Pats or Blanche or you never know what, what, what will happen. So yeah. you, need to, you need to make sure you continue to do the gig properly in the gigs you're in before you worry about any other progressions and stuff like, you know. True. Um, just to finish off, I had mentioned at the start, obviously that a lot of the people that will be listening to this will be sports management and coaching students. For any kind of young or aspiring coaches, be it soccer, I know that's your domain, or just in general, have you any sort of tips for our up and comers about how to kind of how to keep the like standards stuff like that, how to kind of be their best selves, put like put their coaching hat on if you if you want. Yeah, well, that's it. And you mentioned the word standards, and that would be a word that I would use is have standards and demand standards and. By having standards for yourself, it's making sure everything is perfect from what you're doing and what your staff are doing. Because as the manager, I'm responsible for everything. So I'm responsible for the staff, the players, that the buses are booked. If, even though I'm not doing everything, I'm responsible for it. And if I'm you know, asking other people to do certain things, I need to make sure that they'll do it to a certain standard. And if that's setting up a session, that it's set up perfectly, that the bibs are right, the cones are right, there's enough balls, the balls are pumped, the water's done, the nets are, don't have holes in them, all that sort of stuff. The changing room is ready. The match presentation is ready. You've written out your team talk, your set pieces, your numbers, your team sheet, that it's all done perfect, that you really, really do have a standard to. I would say that. I would say do the coaching badges because they're very important. They're only pieces Mm. of paper at the end of the day, but they're pieces of paper that you need to apply for certain jobs. And also you do learn great things and meet great people on the courses. And I would say as well, be brave, apply for things, ask can you be on staff, ask can you have opportunities, ask can you do things. And when you do do them, do them to the best of your ability and try and be the best. And I, I, I like to think that I'm, I try to be the best. And um, I think anybody who's worked with me as players will tell you that I try and, and help them to be the best. And if you know you're coming in every day and you're making the place the best it can be for everybody, that's all you can do. And the majority of people will take that baton and run with it. And that's the gig really is to, is to manage everything to make sure that it's perfect for the players and, and that standards are upheld by everybody. Yeah, I think that's a nice way to leave it. Jamie, thanks very much for coming on to speak to us today. And for everyone listening, thanks for coming to our talk. Cheers, Dan. And thanks for being a your help this year with the teams and with the sport, yourself and Tiff and Kelly and Ronan and uh, all the players and everybody who's been a help to us this year. Connor Murphy, the physio, other physios we've had, bus drivers, uh, you know, Jer and everybody in, in the Link Canteen. Everybody's been fantastic. If I've left everybody out, I'm sorry, but thanks a million for all your help and looking forward to seeing everybody again in September. And everyone stay safe as well. Thanks, Jamie. Talk to you again soon. Cheers, Dan. Thank you. Bye-bye.